Thank you. Thank you, Felice, for um, the generous introduction. Thank you, everyone, for um, being here. And thank you, Dean, for this beautiful exhibition. I would love to thank the Faraj family for, you know, lending all these ex beautiful works in, um, um, for, for everyone else uh, to see. And um, thank you, Christina, for recommending me to come and give this talk here. I am always happy to come to Houston. It's next door, but seems to be the furthest, <laughs> you know, away fr for me to, um, uh, to do. So um, I would like today to actually sort of talk to you about sort of the, the, the origins of where, you know, all this work uh, um, that you're seeing here comes from. Beirut is one of the origins, of, actually, of this place. Beirut in the 1960s was really the place to be. I mean, I, even you know, I personally have my own personal memories of being in Beirut um, summers as a, um, a um, high school uh, student and um, where, in fact, you know, my parents used to always take us there. Um, we ha I had an aunt who lived there, well, deposit us there, and then they go with their friends to do something else in Europe, and we were always happy about that because, A, we're alone with our parents, but also in Beirut or in the mountains, uh, Hamdoun and Ale, and all of my high school friends will be there. Out of, and, and I went to high school in Baghdad. So, you know, it was the place for... Um, everyone to go spend their summer um, as well as, you know, uh, an intellectual hub of things to happen. So decades of economic growth and cultural prosperity culminated in Beirut of the 1960s. There, were, there was sort of new money that was coming in um, from the Gulf states, for example, who were, um, had um, oil money and they were coming to spend their summers in Beirut as well. And so they would deposit their money, but there was also all the intellectuals um, and um, uh, cultural uh, uh, practitioners who for one reason or the other, um, because of the sort of turbulent political um, agenda um, that was happening in the Middle East ended up in Beirut. Some permanently, some would come for visits, um, they would come and go, and so um, uh, that made Beirut the place to be, the place of happening. So a rise of, uh, of these influent individuals who then uh, were uh, uh, residents in Beirut who were also interested in the arts meant that a whole new art infrastructure needed to be developed. So new galleries were all over um, the city, non-commercial art spaces thrived, and exhibition flourished. A Beirut-specific form of cultural cosmopolitanism was in the making. The city served as a platform for a heterogeneous pool of artists um, where they could engage with the political as well as the formal concerns of their time. It was bursting, Beirut was bursting at the seams and um, with, with people, with ideas, um, and um, um, when you know, people look back at that age, the 1960s of Beirut, it's always seemed you know, to, to be thought of as the golden age um, of the city. Of course, the Lebanese Civil War um, that sort of started in 1975, lasted till 1990, brought an end to it for the modern age, although happy to report that I see the comeback of Beirut um, in the last decade. And, you know, and again, you see uh, everyone wants to be um, in Beirut doing things. So this development um, uh, in the city of in the making of the golden age of the city of Beirut really started in the mid 1950s. Beirut became the meeting ground for intellectuals from across the region. West Beirut, Hamra, specifically neighborhood, was the place of intellectual and artistic action. It was a meeting place for artists and intellectuals of all persuasions, all walks of life, nationalists, internationalists, experimentalists, traditionalists. There were cafes that catered for every group, and there were, you know, um, passionate and heated discussions, but there was also always this sort of, you know, um, uh, intellectual um, uh, legacy that was uh, in the, uh, you know, being, being developed. It was a very eclectic community, and because of this sort of openness um, of the city, it became um, a place for various people who were marginalized in their, in their countries, who, as a matter of fact, even moving to Beirut, were living in the margins that were ra rather wide and very encompassing. A good example, and you're seeing here actually um, 
Beirut, um, Hamra Street, 1971, that's in the Hamra neighborhood. You're seeing the effects of the Civil War. This, the egg um, uh, sort of shaped building, um, which is something that they're trying to preserve even um, today and not have it demolished. And a lot of art exhibitions have uh, uh, taken place there. Um, this, this one here. And So this is a city of contradictions. This is that city center there that you see on the left. Best celebrations for Christmas and New Year's if you, if you were in the city at that time. Um, designer shops, um, you know, uh, uh, galleries, major hotels on the uh, edge of it. And then you also see these buildings. It is definitely today, and as has been, and as Adonis, a Syrian Lebanese poet, had said, it was a laboratory of numerous and conflicting tendencies. It is still very much a city of conflict that seem to somehow exist together. A good example of the zeitgeist of that age was a magazine called Cher, Poetry which was a, co a, a quarterly magazine dedicated to poetry and poetry criticism that was founded in 1957 by Yusuf al Khal, who was a Greek Orthodox Lebanese with shrewd editorial instincts, he, um, who lived in America from 1948 to 1955. Cher published 44 issues over 11 years, including manifestos, poems, and letters from abroad. The magazine had correspondences um, uh, correspondence in Cairo, Baghdad, Berlin, Paris, London, and New York, and it published a range of verse in translation. In addition to the magazine, El Khal established a publishing house, um, Dar, uh, Dar Majella Cher, which printed criticism, original poetry, uh, anthologies of foreign verse, and so on. He and his wife, Helen El Khal, who was uh, uh, an artist, founded a gallery for contemporary art. It was called Gallery One where the modernist of the literary um, age as well as the artist would uh, convene a literary salon and would engage and, um, uh, uh, with each other's work and with criticism as well. Helen El Khal, who was born in 23 in the um, United States to Lebanese parents and uh, passed away in 2009, studied paste, painting in Lebanon but she was also an art critic, and she wrote for um, newspapers like the Daily Star and uh, Monday Morning. And she also taught at the American University in Beirut from 67 to 76. She's one of those um, um, uh, women artists, women Lebanese artists, who approached art from the female condition. And her work is largely sort of a, um, autobiographical in nature. But Share, the magazine, was a typical product of its time and place. Beirut, Beirut modernist movement that sort of, you know, one think of as 1955 to 1975 was very much aligned with, aligned with the rise of Beirut, the Lebanese capital, as a center of Arabic intellectual uh, life, replacing Cairo, who was the center of, um, of that before. Lebanon had more liberal sort of um, uh, censorship laws that attracted many of the um, uh, intellectuals from around the, the Arab world, but also many, uh, much of its publishing um, uh, houses was in private hands as opposed to state, which meant they had sort of, you know, a little bit wider range of um, what they can uh, uh, print. This was also the time um, that many immigrants um, uh, flooded Beirut. There were the Palestinians that uh, um, were fleeing north uh, in the wake of the 1948 uh, Nakba, the, the crisis. Um, subsequent waves from Egyptians or Syrians who are either sort of, you know, um, fed up uh, uh, from the, uh, with the sort of monolithic regimes of Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt and the Ba'ath rule in Syria. Um, Iraqis, uh, Iraqi intellectuals and artists were also among, um, and Gulfites, were among the frequent visitors and participants in intellectual events that were taking place, uh, taking place in, in Beirut at the time. So, even, even state press that was sort of, you know, not uh, as liberal as the, the private was also um, known for uh, uh, pointing fingers and, you know, establishing debates that were very, um, uh, un, you know, unheard of in other places in the Arab world. So 
as part of this sort of modern, modern age, there was this popular saying that said, books are written in Cairo, published in Beirut, and read in Baghdad. The saying, actually, more so than the reality of, of um, um, you know, the, the effect of it, but it's, what is interesting and most significant uh, about it is that there is this inherent connectivity, this exchange of ideas, this cycle of um, uh, uh, knowledge that you know, was uh, been uh, produced by these various cities and then disseminated in the various cities. So this also, this saying also becomes sort of my excuse to take you on a somewhat quick and limited tour of modern art in those mentioned cities. I'm only going to look at um, Cairo, Baghdad, Beirut. I will have to sort of stop on, you know, uh, uh, quickly on Palestine because of its important role in the forming of, of uh, modern Beirut as well. Um, to think about um, 20th century development of modern art in the Arab world, uh, one has to you know, always think about the, uh, its connection to politics and how engaged it was in the, in the forces of its time, the local as well as the global. I will just quickly um, give what I'm known to always do, um, my, my spiel about modernism in general, which is all still, even till today, perceived as a non, in the, to think about modernism in the non-Western post-colonial world is still sort of an unresolved issue. Largely, it is perceived as an imposed Eurocentric mode of being by the imperialist colonial powers, because also the modern age is the age of imperialism and colonialism. It operates to exclude and to render the non-West as belated and derivative as it equally imprisons it in a ceaseless cycle of rejection. It is reject rejected as being an equal um, form of mod modernity. But I would um, um, propose that we look at modern art in the Arab world within a non-linear and a non-chronological broad narrative that is dialectical and discursive, as well as inclusive of global influences, continuity, and rupture. Going to look at Cairo, Baghdad, and then Beirut, and the, the cycle of, or let's think, let's, let's say that um, these, point, these cities being the center of modernism, chronologically is different, not concurrent. They, there is this sort of you know, uh, rise or intensifying of um, uh, movements in, in one city um, versus the other throughout the, the uh, uh, 20th century. The articulation of a conscience of an Arab polity to think about the Arab world, and you know, it is a very much contested term when we say Arab, as opposed to like even looking at Nicholas Mfarraj, who was a Lebanese artist. But you know, again, in this sort of uh, uh, spirit of this connectivity, the articulation of a consciousness of an Arab polity may be understood to have emerged from the shifting power, uh, power vectors of the late Ottoman Empire, the 19th and early 20th centuries, when Arab intellectuals specifically began to perceive the need of a collective identity that differentiated them as Arabic speaking. And of course, the definition of Arab um, comes from the uh, modern definition of uh, uh, the modern state definitions of, you know, they speak Arabic, so they are um, Arab nations. And Arab is not, I would um, uh, caution, not a race, but rather a very open ended ethnicity that uh, is um, uh, allowing, uh, that, is, that allows, you know, for variation within it. So the end of the Ottoman Empire, um, there is this need for a new um, collective identity that A, expresses their differentiation that they are Arabic speakers as opposed to the Ottomans who were Turkish speakers, who also early in the 20th century sort of had this, uh, uh, the young Ottoman um, uh, movement, which sort of talked about the Turkish aspect, the identity, this, this kind of, it's the, the age of nation states, and the need for a Turkish identity that was different than the Ottoman. So then, of course, you know, um, then the World War War happens, and the Ottoman lose because they, they entered on the uh, wrong side, and more so, the need for a collective identity um, to um, um, 
express uh, uh, or to, to strengthen uh, that uh, block becomes even um, uh, more pronounced. But um, a very important development around 1860 and that continued through the First World War was the Arab intellectuals in Egypt and in greater Syria undertook a com comprehensive project that is an ontological retrieval and revival of uh, all aspects of life that is known as a Nahda, the Arab Renaissance, a Nahda al Arabiya. So the Nahda project were, you know, um, modernization and reformative projects. Some of them um, had, some of the reformative projects had started under the Ottoman rule. But the Nahda had in it also this intensified desire for nationalism. So the onset of Arab nationalism can be also um, uh, exemplified in aspirations and activities of what was then the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire in Western Asia. They needed this separation, and um, in time, Egypt, despite of its different uh, initial trajectory, would become the eventual leader um, of the notion of pan-Arabism, which you know, traces its roots to that time of the you know, uh, rise of Arab uh, uh, nationalism. So as I said, it is a much contested term of what is an Arab, but the way we would think about it is to think about negotiate this negotiation of this Arab imaginary, because it is an imaginary um, sort of uh, uh, connection, was a necessity during the collapse of the Ottoman Empire of the 19th century and 20th century, as I was saying, and the looming colonial powers. So it was a political um, ideological agenda, but prior to even this sort of you know, uh, political uh, um, negotiation of Arab nationalism, there were the cultural and the people sort of connectivity because of that, A, the Ottoman uh, uh, Empire sort of um, uh, historical, you know, uh, connection, um, uh, cultural connection, but again, because of the Arabic language. And I should, you know, um, um, say here that, of course, not all of the Arab world speaks Arabic only. There are various other languages. This is sort of the definition of where the official language is Arabic in, in these places of the Arab world. So let me start with that tour um, and start taking you through um, uh, some of the development of modern art in the Arab world. Um, so the Arab Nahda actually is very much connected to uh, Nahda al Arabiya, the Arab Renaissance, very much connected to um, uh, Beirut before we even uh, moved to Egypt. Um, there is, in fact, an entry um, in the Monumental Arabic Encyclopedia project that was launched by the intellectual Butrus al-Bustani in Beirut in 1876 that marks out an important sort of threshold for art writing um, as a modern practice. It had a, its title, it was, tri was tri trilingual. It was painting, pintur, and taswir. So it was English, French, and Arabic. But that situated in an age of a lot of uh, sort of, you know, the Western influences, it situated Arabic as a suitable language for uh, writing about um, uh, art and modernity. In Egypt, under the Khedivi uh, monarchy, there were various uh, modernization uh, steps as well. But in Egypt, it was seen more as a national Egyptian. There was this need to go be sort of before um, the, uh, 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 the Islamic age, or uh, even, or sort of the Arabic influences, to the Pharaonic, which is, an, in a way, you know, um, something that happened within the whole region and perhaps was initiated through the arts in, in Egypt because of the importance of, um, uh, of Cairo um, and how you know, things uh, uh, developed. But in a sense, when Egypt becomes sort of the leader of pan-Arabism in the 1950s, to look back at the earlier part of the 20th century, it really just sort of thought about Egypt first before, without any connection to necessarily its, uh, its neighbors. But Egypt was the first, um, Cairo, was the first sort of um, uh, city in the Arab world to establish a school for the fine arts. In 1908, um, the first school of fine arts was open. It was mostly um, 
French educators, uh, French, uh, French artists who were teaching. But what's important is that it graduated the generation of first, um, the first generation of um, uh, modern artists uh, in Egypt, but also became the place to go for Arab artists from the rest of the, the, the region to go study. So these ideas that they sort of de de developed there became important and um, were disseminated to the rest of the Arab world um, because of that. You're looking at the work of Mahmoud Mukhtar, who's thought of as the um, father of um, Egyptian modernism, particularly sculpture. And Mahmoud Mukhtar was one of the first, the first graduating class of, um, in Egypt, and he comes from a very you know, uh, peasant background. He apparently, you know, the story goes that he used to make sculpture out of uh, uh, mud um, by the, the Nile River. He comes to this school. He's then sent to Paris, actually, on a scholarship. And in fact, this um, specific exhibition known as Nahdat Mas, or you know, the um, uh, Egypt Awakening or Egypt uh, uh, Rising, was his, um, uh, he made this sort of a small sculpture for a, um, uh, an exhibition in Paris in 1920. He was so affected by the 1919 um, uh, revolution in Egypt that he created this, a small uh, model of it in the um, uh, exhibition that was then seen by a number of visiting Egyptian students that included a, an important Egyptian politician, um, Wissa Wasif, who then uh, goes back to Egypt and for eight years they campaign to build this as a major monument in Cairo, where it now stands in front of the um, Cairo University. It had moved places. What is important about this is that it initiates this notion of neo pharaonic style. I mean, clearly, one can see the references of the neo pharaonic um, the, you know, the, the uh, monumentality of um, uh, uh, the figures. It's a sphinx, and it's a, a peasant woman. In a way, it ha was seen by Saad Zaghloul, who was the, the you know, famous uh, Egyptian politician, as um, expressing the Egyptian identity of that time. It is the pharaonic age rising, but, and, but aiding the peasant of Egypt, who are the majority of Egypt, to you know, uh, reform and modernize the country. And it's a peasant woman who is un, sort of opening the veil. So all of this sort of had all that symbolic um, uh, uh, iconography that became very important and it's made in granite and the granite comes from uh, Luxor in Egypt so you know the, and this actually is the first um, uh, public monument uh, Egyptian public monument by an Egyptian artist in Egypt but and I'm, I'm going to show you actually a number of artists who um, were uh, artists who were based in Alexandria where um, uh, Nicholas was was born and you know the theory is that he eventually may have, um, you know, stumbled uh, through their work. This is a work of um, uh, Mahmoud uh, Nagy, who is, or Nagy, as the Egyptians uh, would say, the cycle of life. This was actually commissioned in the 19 in 1920 for a uh, hospital in Alexandria. It shows sort of a, a cycle that has a lot of biblical references of, um, um, you know life and death, basically, and sickness, and, and um, with, you know, all the, the, the uh, 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 religious references that it comes with it. And, you know, I've prepared a, a vi this very elaborate presentation that I am now um, realizing that um, I need to go through much faster than I anticipated. So, um, Mahmoud Saeed, for example, who's also another um, Alexandria-based artist who, in fact, was a, um, um, a lawyer um, and a judge um, uh, throughout the life of his father. And the minute his father passed away, he um, resigned um, uh, or retired and became an artist because he's always wanted to, to be an artist. So those are artists who um, took classes um, it, while, you know, they, they, I mean, this is an aristocrat as opposed to uh, Mahmoud Mukhtar, who was a peasant. Mahmoud Mukhtar was on a, a, a government scholarship. This, this guy, uh, Mahmoud uh, Saeed, was actually studying uh, law in France, but on the side took some art classes, and he um, was very fascinated with uh, painting uh, sort of uh, the, you know, the, the peasantry um, of his age. And in fact, you know, this, this work that you're seeing um, uh, on the um, um, on your left um, is a work that was sold at Sotheby's in 2010 for I think 200,000, um, uh, 200 rather, sorry, 200 million dollars, uh, which broke um, various records of uh, um, uh, Arab art. But 
So this sort of um, uh, neo pharaonic um, take, which in painting um, was manifest in looking back at rural Egypt, um, was a phase that was then sort of um, short-lived. And other artists that came after, um, and many of those artists of that first generation, you know, established journals. Um, they were very engaged with various artists. Uh, someone like Ramses Yunan, for example, who was part of the Art and, uh, and Liberty group, um, who was a group of artists who connected with the Surrealists in, uh, in Europe um, in their anti-fascist um, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, call of, um, you know, liberating um, art and, and um, uh, rejection of uh, fascism um, and this notion of engaging with, um, the, with the global, with the international was criticized by many in Egypt because it was um, a time of growing sentiments of pan-Arabism. Um, and so then a new group, um, that contemporary art group, was uh, uh, developed. And artists like Hamid, uh, Hamid Neda that you see um, here on your right uh, exemplifies this sort of return to what was known as popular mythology that kind of connected more with the people, um, the, with poverty, with oppression, as opposed to sort of more um, um, international um, concerns. But they kind of, this was the time of um, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the, the free officers um, uh, revolution of 1952. And so sort of you really coincided with it in, at the right time um, of promoting pan-Arabism and uh, the connection and the revolutions. And you know, um, the 1950s was the age of revolutions in, um, in the Arab world. Many um, other revolutions uh, took place. And, you're looking at um, work of um, uh, Abdul Hadi Ghazar, for example, on the left with this, this mitaq, which, which has been having various interpretations because this is also the time that dissent against Gamal Abdel Nasser, you know, symbolically starts showing in, in the work. And in the work of Tahiya Halim, uh, one of um, the, uh, uh, women, you know, women artists um, uh, in Egypt who did this sort of um, uh, installation uh, work in, um, uh, in the 1960s, which sort of, you know, criticizes um, the creation of the uh, um, Aswan Dam and um, its uh, sort of uh, ecological uh, problematics. I am, of course, only giving you a quick view and very limited number of artists in my way inching to um, get to Beirut. Um, and so now we're moving on to Iraq and um, the development of modernism in Iraq, which sort of, you know, um, takes place mostly in the 1950s. And the um, uh, uh, Iraqi artists become very sort of engaged with, uh, with the Beirut art scene in time. You're looking again at sort of the development of, um, of modernism in um, uh, early artists who actually were Ottoman officers. As being part of the Ottoman army, they took painting classes to paint, you know, um, battlegrounds and topography and so on. When um, the Ottoman Empire was dismantled, they come back to uh, Baghdad, they become the art teachers. There is no art school yet in, um, um, in Baghdad at the time, and many of the you know, Iraqi artists were being sent on scholarships to Europe. Um, you know, um, very few were go also going to uh, the school in Cairo. But so they, these free ateliers, for example, um, Hafel Drubi here on the right, is the first one to, to establish and open a free atelier for um, uh, um, artists to go um, um, you know, just work there. But we see something similar to the neo pharaonic um, style happening here. There's also references to um, historic or, you know, the sort of un uh, contaminated uh, pre-mandate um, era of, of Iraq, but in a way it's also taking stock of this new country, Iraq, that, you know, this new republic that they are now kind of discovering. So, you know, very, um, the, the landscape, very um, uh, romantic sort of landscapes of Baghdad where, you know, you're not really seeing, you know, suburbs of Baghdad, you're not really seeing people or old um, neighborhood, the sort of the nostalgic, uh, nostalgia to old neighborhood. An important development that happens in the development of modern art in, um, in Baghdad is, um, uh, and this is an important thing that, you know, um, throughout the region is art movements, art groups. So the Baghdad Group for Modern Art that was formed in 1951, for example, by um, two main artists, um, 
who sort of the, the, the way they come to doing this, artists were like in Egypt, very connected to the Museum of Antiquity. They were looking at their heritage, um, pre-Islamic heritage as well as Islamic. But one of the artists, one of the Iraqi artists was in Paris when one of the journals published a new discovery, which are these two images of Maqamat al-Hariri, 13th century assembly um, that of, of um, al-Hariri, uh, which was um, illustrated by by um, uh, an artist, Yahya al -Wasati. to I mean, it was a discovery for the world. This is, you know, the first manuscript that they can have as a whole manuscript. Two images of that in the magazine that were brought to Baghdad. And in this sort of search for identity that, as we saw happening in Egypt and was happening in Iraq as well, this played an important role. It's not just the Sumerian and Assyrian heritage that they had, but there was a so-called school of painting, school of Baghdad of painting, that they can see that they, in fact, you know, it, it, it situates them immediately in the modern age because of the you know, two-dimensionality of it, um, the use of color, and uh, the flatness of shapes. So this becomes a nucleus of development of um, uh, the manifesto of uh, the Baghdad Group for Modern Art that wanted to forge this continuity with their Islamic age as well as Mesopotamian and as well as connect with uh, the, the rest of um, uh, development that happened in, uh, um, in Europe. The two main members um, or the co-founders of the Baghdad Group for Modern Art, Shakir Hassan al Said, whose work you're seeing here, who studied in Paris, who in Paris while he's studying, um, had a sort of a, a ner a, 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 an emotional, uh, let's say, um, uh, depression situation that led him to uh, Sufism and uh, led him to you know, new um, influences in his art that uh, in his art that kind of you know moved him from the uh, three-dimensional sort of um, um, naturalistic work into the two-dimensional works that engages again with um, with Iraq with its history of Iraq with its uh, folk folklore and mythology and then Jawad Salim the other co-founder who also actually studied in in Italy in um, um, in Paris and in um, uh, in London um, and was sort of the the the, the passionate dandy of of uh, the group who kind of um, developed this um, uh, concept we that we we dub hilaliyat the crescent shape where you see I mean this is mother and child it's a, again a crescent and uh, the faces are crescents almond shapes that are so so Marian, but at the same time they are um, repetitive repetitive sort of pattern that is akin to uh, an Islamic. Uh, um, um, uh, a pattern um, that you know we see um, uh, a lot around us. This is sort of you know where um, his um, uh, final um, sort of work. He passed away uh, while this was being built. Um, again, this like the Nahdat uh, Mus. This is Nasb al um the uh, uh, monument of uh, freedom in Baghdad Square, which was a major um, accomplishment because again it was the first public monument by an Iraqi artist um, to be in Iraq. So um, some of the work, because 1958 was the, the um, revolution that took place in Iraq, and of course, you know, um, new ideas uh, were taking place, engaging with local, but also like you know, the massacre in Algiers. So the sort of the human um, struggling, um, and um, um, uh, and of course, you know, uh, artist persuasions, uh, political persuasions, you know, played a role in in some of that. A very in, you know, important artist who actually was a um, important part of the 1960s Beirut development is um, uh, Diyal Azawi, who, was, um, who studied archaeology as well as art, and exhibited a lot in Beirut. And until today, he's based in London, until today, much of his work um, is um, in you know, continuous exhibitions that you see in, um, um, in Beirut. Another sort of movement that was happening in the Arab world at the same time was what we call harufiya, which is the use of Arabic text, which you also can see in, in the work of uh, Nicholas and Faraj, um, but you know, in a very dif distinct way from Islamic calligraphy. And those are some of the, the early works, um, the early artists who started the works, the works are not very early, but during the 1970s and 80s, Almost every artist in the Arab world experimented with, the, with harufiya one way or the other. So um, 
quickly passing through uh, some of the Palestinian work because many of the Palestinian artists also ended up um, being in Beirut and because a Palestine became a very important um, unifying moment in Arab art, seeing the work of Smail Shamut, the work of Sliman Mansour, Smail Shamut, who was also actually part of the um, PLO at the time, so we had an official uh, position, but in the 70s also there was an association of uh, Arab artists that was um, developed and um, Ismail Shamut becomes the secretary of it um, and um, you know that is the, the, the nucleus of that association um, took place um, in various meetings that happened in Beirut um, actually uh, earlier before um, it became official and uh, Sliman Mansour's Jamal uh, al-Mahamil Camel of Hardship is one of the most famous um, but this sort of shows the, the shift between um, Palestine the victim to Palestine endurance to Palestine resistance in the wake of um, um, the Intifada in the 1980s and the boycott of um, all material that was imported by, uh, by Israel. Now we're quickly going to go to Beirut and I'm showing you image of Beirut in 19, you know, 1888. You know, Beirut was repopulated also because of a civil war that happened in Mount Lebanon in the 1980s that meant a lot of people came down to live in the city of Beirut and um, a new middle class um, and more new, new affluent uh, class was uh, developed. But that Nahda, that, uh, Nahda project, that the um, Arab Renaissance that I was uh, talking about, also created those affluent people in uh, Beirut who would be buying art. One of the um, uh, sort of pioneer of um, um, Lebanese uh, artists, Dawood Qurm, and I was um, talking earlier to um, Dean and, and uh, Nabil and saying that what is interesting is that the um, in a, in a way, modern art uh, started in Beirut before anywhere else in the Arab world because of the church. From the 16th century, you know, the, the church was very active in having artists who were mostly clerks, but they were doing, you know, oil painting um, in the church. And um, so because of biblical um, um, history, so they were producing art. And um, Daoud Korn, for example, who's from uh, a village in Mount uh, uh, Lebanon, was um, uh, discovered by one of the church clerks who saw a three-dimensional um, drawing of a bird on a rock that they thought it was real, they come to touch it, so they find out that this kid is doing it, and they actually hire him to um, uh, teach uh, painting in the church while he's taking uh, Italian classes served him very well because as you see here, um, he's, uh, he goes to, to uh, uh, Rome. He actually paints a portrait of, of the Pope, Pius, uh, um, uh, and uh, this becomes actually his calling card. So he uses this image as his card. He comes back to Beirut, he actually opens the Maison de, uh, de Art, which, becomes, which is an art supply place, but also a place of gathering, a place of uh, exchange of ideas, and this sort of you know, cosmopolitan um, age of Beirut um, starts. Again, some of that same generation, Khalil Sali, uh, Salibi, uh, Mustafa Farrukh, who are um, uh, important um, uh, figures in the development of an art consciousness, who became teachers of um, many of the uh, later generation of artists. But I mean, a look at, this is a view of Beirut in 1929 uh, versus you know, the, the images of, uh, of Beirut that we're seeing later. Paul uh, Garagosian, for example, who is um, a uh, Armenian artist born in Jerusalem, who was displaced so many times, but then ends up in Beirut, also becomes a teacher, um, and um, uh, becomes an important uh, uh, member of the Beirut art scene, um, who introduces sort of this uh, uh, abstraction um, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a very pronounced way that becomes hallmark of his style. These are some of those artists actually were exhibited here in the United States in the 1960s and 70s as part of the United, um, as the, part of the State Department um, initiatives. Um, Shafiq Aboud, who, um, and, and, and those artists that I have been um, showing you, many of whom 
sort of took classes. They were um, self-taught in various ways. They did take classes in the European cities where they, um, they ended up, whether in Paris or in, uh, in Rome. Many of them went to Rome, but also in Paris. In fact, Shafiq Aboud uh, moved to Paris and he passed away in, um, in Paris. And uh, he is considered uh, a French artist as well. Um, Salwa Rodash Air, who um, had a, a major retrospective exhibition at Tate Modern a few years ago, um, is one of those um, uh, Lebanese women artists who um, introduced new ideas, different ideas, but what is interesting is that she also discovered sort of the um, and, and going, um, she, wants, she goes to Spain, she goes to Andalusia, in other words, and she looks at the Islamic heritage, which very much, much impresses her, and she starts sort of, you know, including um, Western, I mean, European thought, but as well as Islamic thought in the way that she composed work. This sculpture, for example, which, you know, sort of a combination of poetry and mathematics in, in her very complex um, work is seen in this um, structure with, with 1,000 small pieces um, in, in the work. Um, these are, this is a, a self-portrait of her. Um, again, um, another sort of work of, of uh, abstraction uh, by her. And abstraction in Beirut has a very sort of, you know, um, uh, different history as, as well. And, you know, that has been in fact contested lately in, in to how, to what extent did America, U.S. Uh, intervention um, direct the development of the um, abstraction in Beirut? An image of Ital Adnan, who is one of the artists who, in fact, interviewed uh, um, uh, Nicholas um, uh, when he had an exhibition in Beirut. Um, she's a poet, a literary person who is currently uh, lives in Paris, but she also she studied in Paris, but as well as in, in Berkeley and, and lived in Berkeley for a while and Harvard. Um, she's a literary figure who used to do a lot of sort of abstract paintings to accompany her poetry, but is now um, um, kind of uh, actually painting more than she ever did uh, before in, um, in her life. Uh, Uget Kaland, who um, um, actually still lives in California, um, who is someone who worked with textiles as well. Um, and in fact, you're looking at one of the um, um, uh, kaftans that she um, developed with uh, Pierre Cardin. Um, she is someone who, um, you know, um, did an incredible sort of erotic exhibitions in Beirut in 1960s. So Gallery One and Contact Gallery that was established by um, uh, an, a Lebanese businessman and an Iraqi uh, graphic designer uh, um, in um, uh, 1960s was uh, an exhibit was a gallery that not only focused. I mean, you know, there was Lebanese art, but there was also um, it was the age of Pan Arabism. So there was a lot of of Arab artists who were uh, exhibiting there, but also um, artists who were not um, uh, accepted or were censored elsewhere in in the world, including in the U in the U.S. as well as you know things that would be considered cultural taboos at the time, or even even more so today, probably. Um, and then Laura Grabe, um, who also uh, was one of those uh, women artists who engaged with um, variations of tapestry and, and drawing in her work. This sort of, you know, puts um, Nicholas in sort of a, um, in a very kind of um, good um, um, context of how this, um, um, uh, the media was developing. I want to end up with, as a Lebanese artist, with uh, Arif Reyes, who did this work uh, in the homage to Martin Luther King in 1968, um, uh, and that was exhibited um, in Beirut. And um, he is an important um, Lebanese artist who actually, during the Civil War, moved to live in Jeddah. He became an art uh, consultant, and there are major sculpture by him in the city of Jeddah in Saudi Arabia up till today. And, um, Moving back to sort of, you know, um, the engagement of um, uh, Arab artists in general with Beirut. So this is um, the work by the Iraqi artists Azawi, Sabra, and Shatila, which was the uh, Palestinian uh, refugee camp. Um, and, you know, this is sort of uh, uh, immortalizing that massacre that took place um, in 1982 in Sabra and Shatila, and this is a work that actually was on uh, exhibit at the Tate Modern as well, was uh, purchased uh, by the Tate Modern. These are drawings, by the way, so this is sort of hand-drawn, um, um, and he, he did them while he uh, was sitting, um, did them on the floor. <laughs> 
I want to do a, a, a shout out to this site. If you go to the Saradar collection, um, they have this platform called Perspective One. This, this shows you um, the, from 1955 to 1975, the galleries and the amount of exhibitions, there were 214 exhibitions. Um, the, the number of artists is only the artists that so far are in their collection who were exhibiting in uh, that time, not um, the artists who were exhibiting in Beirut, but you know, 37 art spaces that were all over the city that you know, had, were important um, places of generating um, uh, intellectual thought of uh, art uh, engagement as well as um, uh, promoting different styles. And my last slide is actually a contemporary work by Joanna Haji Thomas and Khalil Jrej, um, which is the, sort of almost like a postcard, uh, Wonder Beirut, uh, first part, the, sto uh, the sort of gives the story of the Beirut before, the Beirut after, um, because um, in the 1990s, there has been sort of, uh, since the 1990s, a rise of the, what we call the post-Civil War um, artist of Beirut, who, uh, many of whom actually studied here in the United States, and so they're very active in the scene here as well, and um, this sort of the, the, the legacy of the unresolved legacy of the Civil War still dominates many of the work, and Laura, uh, Laura Grabe that I showed you earlier is someone who also still engages with the massacres of um, in the you know the the trauma of the civil war thank you very much for your attention